Well, we may be an intimate group. Uh, would you like to start, Daniel? Or would you like to wait a little bit? I'll just go ahead and start. This will be recorded, and I know it's lunchtime, so. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Daniel Wheaton. I'm the data reporter for Midwest Newsroom, and I'm also a uh, graduate student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in geography. So this is going to be a little bit graduate seminar, a little bit data training. So this is the first section. Don't worry, I won't bore you. Um, it's just a really quick hash of major ideas to understand what informs what maps works and what maps don't work in journalism. So why do we need geography? Geography and history are two all-encompassing disciplines. History is the story of humanity through time, while geography is the story of humanity through space. As a discipline, geography is very interdisciplinary in which as data becomes more spatial and more data is created for literally everything, geography has become a part of that. And it's most obvious in how we consider news judgment. We often, you know, mostly focused our stories get in a given spatial area. And it's not just space, it's also place. So one thing to consider is that if something is spatial, typically it's math, it's data, it's numbers, it's quantitative. When you talk about places, that's the empathy, that's the human element, that's the, the palatial meaning. So geography often struggles between the description of things that matter to people in societies, the palatial perspective, and the spatial perspective, that of statistics, that of data, that of what we're trying to do when we visualize something in a given space. So there have been three major historical paradigms of geography. The one that went on the longest is the designed earth, which kind of drives with most major world religions in which a benevolent creator created a balanced world. This uh, created a number of kind of interesting philosophies and um, beliefs, especially when during the age of exploration, in which a lot of explorers believed if there's this massive landmass of Eurasia and Africa, there has to be some opposite ones, some Terra Australis, which is why Australia is called Australia, because they thought that there would be an opposite version of Eurasia on the other side of the earth. This also kind of plays into societies and politics, because if you believe in a designed earth theory, Climates are God-given and immutable. We are here to do whatever we want with the earth. Therefore, overpopulation is impossible. Obviously, we know this isn't true, but it is interesting how these kind of geographic ideas still kind of play into some political perspectives today. So one of the most damaging um, paradigms was the one that really went on for more or less the 1800s, and that's environmental determinism. This was originated all the way back with Aristotle, in which he believed that different people naturally had different humors, the four juices that make up the human body. And they claim that people in certain climates have certain traits which cause them to be hardworking or lazy. You can see how this line of thinking is very useful for colonizers and racists, as entire mental determinism was kind of used during the age of exploration to justify colonizing the entire world, because these quote-unquote people aren't as good as Westerners or whatever colonizing force you were. So this existed until about the turn of the century and then debate happened and it went away. But now we're currently in the human impact paradigm that we shape the world by assigning value to resources. That when we say a place matters is because we choose to make it matter. You know, think about how um, oil reserves and things like that in which before we know that we're there, this could be just be viewed as some barren wasteland, but when we realize that there's a valuable resource in there, that's when humanity economics comes in and we assign value to that space and that place. And uh, just to break up the kind of seminar, here's a map of um, the Earth circa, uh, I believe this was um, Plato. So just kind of interesting how you know, it was relatively correct, even at that time. Um, they didn't know how far Africa went, but look at the shape of, you know, Saudi Arabia and even like in, in Asia, like guessing what the world was. It's kind of impressive that they got this far. So paradigms of geography have also shaped Western history. Uh, the German Academy really defined geography as a discipline pretty much the entirety of the 1800s. Geopolitics as an idea really emerges during this time, and that's when you get some concepts that were kind of used in Nazi propaganda, such as Liebenstrom kind of claim, because they viewed Germany and Eastern Europe as the breadbasket of the world, and they believed that if a power controlled the breadbasket, they controlled the center part of the world island, and therefore they could be the dominant force in the world itself. 
Environmental determinism was unfortunately turbocharged by Darwin, as this easily fits in with the theory of evolution, which was published in 1850 with On Origin of Species. And Ellen Semple, who was the first president of the American Association of Geographers, really pushed this idea in the 1800s until about the 1920s. And this thinking really informed those in power pretty much until World War II. And a lot of those philosophies of Nazism do come from environmental determinism because they wanted to shape the world under their perspective that they believe that the Nordic race or uh, Europeans in general were superior to others. And it is kind of interesting how these echoes of these theories still echo today in general perceptions of racism. It's like, I don't think people realize that how we consider space ultimately created a lot of the social problems we're still dealing with today. So it got kind of spicy in 1948 when Harvard said that geography is not a university subject and kicked the department out of the university. And this was when also environmental determinism was rejected as a paradigm. This is when a number of alternate geographies emerged, including Marxist geographies, feminist geographies, and spatial justice. Basically, given that we assigned value to space, we should consider our decisions spatially in a more equitable and just way, which is the perspective of geographer Edward Soja. And at the same time as technology advanced, this is when GIS science finally comes together. This is called the spatial turn in which people tried to use space and data to better understand the world. Think about this from everything from remote sensing to Wi-Fi networks, radio. This is all using space in a way to communicate and using geography in our everyday lives. So that's why that geography tends to be with a number of other departments. At UNL, it's combined with sociology and anthropology, anthropology, and also we partner with community and regional planning, which is the very applied GIS stuff, and natural resources. So everything from tracking fish and animals to you know, how certain plants do well in certain environments. So uh, this is kind of where we are now. This is an image from the Ezra User Conference, which is a massive conference in San Diego I went to last summer. More than 20,000 people went. And this is software that's used everywhere from journalists to researchers to environmentalists. Basically, spatial data can be used in nearly any way, given that nowadays we just have so much of it. So moving on from the theory to actually doing it, here are some GIS basics to kind of understand what spatial data is and how it works. So it's kind of under, important to understand some key terms. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with geography, we have to simplify the earth because obviously it's, how do you perceive that in even a computer? Like that would take like all the supercomputers in the world to make that correctly. So we established geocity, which is a shape and model of the earth. So we need to have a datum, which is the measurement of the entire earth, however you want to put it and then various projections and coordinate systems. So coordinate systems we're usually familiar with, this is latitude and longitude, but there can be other ones that use different maths depending on how you wanna deal with the fact that the earth is not a perfect sphere, it's actually an ellipsoid and it's kind of squished because earth itself is kind of fatter along the equator and it is kind of thinner at the top. So think of it kind of like a, kind of like a smushed softball. Uh, because of that, that makes some distance calculations complicated. So when it comes to GIS, there are two major sources of data. We have rasters and we have vectors. Rasters are just a grid and actually most photos are rasters. It's a grid of colors and pixels. So what you do is that you assign value to the color within the raster and you have this grid that is a really condensed file type. So you can have a ton of information in there. So like when a remote sensor goes across the earth and like, let's say captures temperature data, we then have a, a um, image of a picture of a landscape and you would see the different values of where the temperature is hotter or colder. But when we get that information, it has to be somewhat translated because we need to understand um, basically how this information was obtained. And the other is vector data. So vector data is just geometry. You have points, you have lines, polygons, multi-polygons, which are just you know the computer drawing something in a given space. So what we have here is uh, something I did for class. It's suitability analysis uh, for this bat that lives in Northeast Iowa. And as you can see, I used a com combination of various data sources in order to see where this bat likes to live. Um, so question for the audience, of the forest, cart topology, and rivers, which data source do you think was the raster? Okay, very rude to ask, a question. Um, to ask us questions. Hey, we want to make sure that you all have time, <laughs> face time and voice time. 
So if no one wants to answer or guess, um, the raster data is the karst topology and the forests, and the vector data is the rivers. So the rivers are actually lines that are drawn. So all factors combined, that's the GIS doing the math of combining the forests, the Turk karst topology and rivers to see where this bat likes to live. And as you can see, it generally likes to be kind of in the Western part where there are some caves and obviously trees where they can get food. Um, this is useful for a number of environmental science applications. And it could also be useful if you wanted to like combine socioeconomic data to something political as well. So let's understand some software and files. Uh, there are two major GIS organizations out there. There's Esri, which is the enterprise software. Think of it kind of as like the Tesla of GIS. It does a bunch of fancy things. It's very expensive. And it does a good job of explaining itself on its website. It is kind of annoying because it likes to store data in its own proprietary software format, which is the geodatabase. So it can be really annoying to share that information. So that's kind of why when you're requesting data from like a city government or a county government, they can be kind of annoying because they're saving it in this Esri way. So it's kind of hard to get from one place to another. But you can export specific features in a shape file, which is still the most common form of geodata, but is not used among enterprise as often anymore as it was in the past. And there's also QGIS, which is open source software, which works great, but also is very buggy. It is uh, very difficult to use because it's not very obvious. And some of the screen sizes get really annoying, but you can pretty much put anything inside of QGIS. I find it really useful when I have various data sets need to join on like a name of like a county name or a location. I'm able to put that information in there, be that CSV or a shape file, join it really easy in a way that's a lot more efficient than using Excel or even SQL. So here's why you all came, me explaining the question, should this be mapped? So this is almost easier to explain from the opposite end of here's why I won't map something. So the first problem is called the modifiable aerial unit problem or the MAUP. I've never heard anyone call it MOP, but sounds fun. So the problem is, Data obviously doesn't exist in these imaginary lines that we put on maps, like countries, counties, cities. Reality doesn't care about that. So the example on the left uses illness as an example. So if you were to take this point data and put it inside of polygons, obviously that data source is going to get messed up depending on where you draw the lines. So obviously the one on the bottom right is wrong because that one point doesn't represent 100% of the illness. And... The other ones can also be various ways of miscommunicating this. This is actually how gerrymandering works. Of you draw the lines where the people are, you're essentially using the modifiable area unit problem to put people in certain locations depending on their political leanings and their voting history. So if I have a data source that I know will be wrong on a certain level, like think about trying to take data that's on like a county level and bumping that up to state, we know that isn't accurate when we kind of put a whole new layer of perspective on it. So that's why it doesn't make sense to communicate. So if you have data that is very, very specific, like just Kansas City or just St. Louis, I'm not going to do a map of Missouri of just that data because we know it's going to be wrong because we're using the modifiable aerial unit problem incorrectly. So the second problem is just a population map. Um, this is a famous XKCD comic, which kind of explains it. Um, just because uh, there are people in a place, it doesn't mean that you know it actually communicates something. So if a map is just going to look like a population map, it's not really worth making because what are you really saying? You're just saying people are there. And um, I always find it funny they chose Martha Stewart Living for this one. It's a different audience. And the other problem is that if there are too many variables, um, so this is an example of cramming way too much information into one map. Um, I am slightly colorblind and I struggle with some yellows. So to me, this is incredibly just messy and it doesn't communicate anything. So ideally a map just has one value because if you're doing a chloropleth, which is this kind, you need to just have that one value because if you put more things, it gets confusing and then you're expecting the user to actually interface with it, which we know they usually don't. So this is something I wouldn't create because it's too much going on and it's very confusing. And the only way I would have probably shared this data would be probably separating it out into, into different maps. So we have um, a different understanding of what's going on. Go ahead, Al. What do you think they were trying to, to show that like, 
if you can read and write, you can earn a higher salary. I mean, what, what were they trying to do? I'm, I don't I'm, know I'm mystified. I, I just Googled bad math examples and this one was a good one of. Okay. This also yeah, I mean, I don't even, have... it makes me not even want to like yeah. engage with it. That's, that's me as a user. To me, this reads like an editor in chief had an idea and just wouldn't budge. So the designer was like, okay, fine, here you go. Um, yeah, th this is what happens when you don't have a dialogue with people who are actually making stuff because it gets very confusing. So the other problem that happens a lot with a number of things is if we don't have census geographies, because the census is very specific in how it deals with um, data and space. So the diagram on the left, kind of imagine it like something breaks into pieces. So we have the nation, which obviously is made up of states. States are made up of counties. Counties are made up of census tracts, and they go all the way down to the block. So it is possible to kind of move vertically with data. So you could add up all of the blocks in a certain place, which becomes a block group, which then becomes a tract, which then becomes a county, which then becomes a state, which then becomes the U.S. But if you get outside of that kind of central chain, which is in that diagram on the right, that's where it gets messy and confusing. Like you can't go from voting districts to tribal census tracts or from zip codes to places because those are entirely different things. And also how they do surveys, which the American Community Survey, which is most of the census data we use because that's the actual information about interesting things, not just do you live in a place. Census data from the American Community Survey is mostly going to be in that central pillar of census geographies and occasionally in those other ones. But in those other ones that are smaller, sometimes they don't get data from those places. So for instance, there's another geography called a Puma, which is the public use microdata areas. I don't know why the census loves big cats because there's also the tiger database for some reason. But even so, Pumas are only areas that I believe have about 60,000 people in them. So there's only like two Pumas in like Lincoln, Nebraska. So it wouldn't be useful for me to use that data to compare it to the whole state because the rest of the state's just too rural to have that information. So if we get information that isn't aligned with the census, I can't add census context to it. So that's why it's important to always get data that fits somewhere neatly in the kind of central pillar of census data, because that's when we can add good stuff to it. And I know I've said this multiple times, um, zip codes are not geographies. Zip codes are just places where the postal office decides to deliver based on basically network analysis and roads. There are some zip codes in California that are actually disconnected, which is kind of nuts. Um, but sometimes you see data that's in the zip code level. It's not ideal. Sure, people know where their zip code is, but they don't know the ones around them. So it's not particularly useful. So it's best to um, uh, change that. And yeah, um, zip codes do change. Um, not too frequently, like maybe 15, 20 years. Um, I know my grandparents' zip code changed when I was like 11 and they wouldn't stop complaining about it. Um, so yeah, it does happen. Um, I'm not certain how often. It probably depends on like a regional post office decision of how to handle that. But um, yeah, I've always joked to get this um, census geography thing tattooed in my body because I feel like I talk about it at least once a week. So when it comes to mapping, geography has to matter. Either it's the placial thing I discussed earlier or the spatial thing. If geography is not central to the visualization, it shouldn't be a map. So that's kind of the, my main thesis of this whole discussion of let's make sure we're actually mapping things that matter as opposed to just having data that happens to have geography in it. So here's an example. Um, Elizabeth Rembert did a story on honey last week. And as you can see, this data is kind of all over the place because different states produce different amounts of honey and the trends go up, go down, and we also have the nation in there. This would be incredibly difficult to map because look at the range alone. Like Illinois has much smaller ranges than Nebraska or Iowa. And then how do you get the change in there? Like this could work in a map, but it would be incredibly complicated to explain. So that's why I went with the small multiples of lines of here you can actually see the trends. And if you really care that much, you can hover over it and see exactly how many um, thousand pounds of honey each state or nation is currently making. So moving on to mapping tools for publishing, this will be the data wrapper section. Um, as I've mentioned before, data wrapper is great because it's explanatory. It's about 
telling a story. It's not about doing statistics and regressions and seeing if things are connected. It's about communicating a story to someone. So Data Wrapper has three kinds of mapping tools, locator maps, symbol maps, and chloropleth maps. The most common one I use for stories are chloropleth maps, which is where you put a value inside of a aerial unit, be it a county, a state, whatever, and then that communicates that data information. So here are some other examples that I've done in the past. Here are locator examples. So I took the shape of Marshalltown. This is for a story that Cassie Arena did about three years ago. And then I had that um, path of tornado that I laid on top. I used GeoJSON and QGIS to export that. And I also had the petitions of the house that the woman was getting in Iowa. And we had the addresses, so I was able to geocode them, put them into data wrapper, and then stylize them as little homes. Here's a chloropleth example and an example of what I can do with the tooltips. So this was a story we did early on with the California newsroom showing the change of smoky days across the Midwest. And even though zips aren't geography, for some reason they were in zips, but whatever, it worked. Um, but I'm able to stylize tooltips so you could read it nicely what was going on. And finally, here's a symbol map in which I'm putting points on a existing state. And this is a story that Natalie Krebs did about how rural hospitals are delivering fewer babies. And um, the downside with this is that there aren't a ton of base maps. So it kind of has to just be counties. So I don't use this too often, but for points, it is useful. And here's another one that I did um, just two weeks ago for um, IPR. And this is a map of the cicada broods that are coming this summer um, in the Midwest. And what I did from this was, here's how it looks inside my GIS. So the points are the point data of all of the cicada broods, and the polygons are the result of a geoprocessing tool called point to polygon, which created those shapes. And then I pulled that into Illustrator, added a Gaussian blur to that polygon, so it looks nice and fuzzy. Because as you can see, it looks kind of chunky here and like it's weirdly shaped and there's that really tiny bit like in Arkansas and across the south it looks weird. So by adding the blur, it made it look kind of nice. And also it's kind of obvious they mostly check for cicadas like along roads and stuff. So I kind of wanted to obfuscate, obfuscate that fact. So that's kind of why I went with this design. And this is what it looks like with an illustrator with the layers. And as you can see, I was playing with other ideas, which is why I had the tiny US over there and also a crop version. But because they wanted to have it kind of as a big photo, I chose to make it in this kind of large way for IPR. And also IPR has a custom theme on their groves, so that's why their um, color is off-white. All right, that's the main part of the presentation. Here's just some bonus maps of stuff that I've done for class or in the past. Um, this is my first big project I did in my first class, which is internet speeds across Nebraska. Um, I did make a mistake here in which I forgot to actually project Nebraska, which is why it looks perfectly straight when it should actually be kind of curved. Um, but yeah, this is a combination of just pulling in some uh, census data combined with the number of internet tests across Nebraska, and I just put together this infographic. Um, pretty sure I got an A plus on this. Uh, here's another assignment we did um, using another geoprocessing tool, which is to assign value to the arrows. Um, these are the people who have left uh, Lancaster County, Nebraska from 2010 and 2016. And as you can see, I made the, uh, the arrows super chunky if they had a large value and super thin if they ha had a small one. And as you can see, um, I know it's messy. I just kind of did it for class real fast. But mostly um, people from Lancaster County are going to big cities, big counties like San Diego County, San Bernardino County in, in California, Chicago, parts of Iowa, and of course, the major Texas cities. And here's a big project we did for the San Diego Union Tribune called Our Immigrant Story. Um, this is actually a double truck. So it's the entire first page of the paper, both the front and back. So um, the people, what is on the outside of the paper, and then the map and the story was in the inside. And basically, we wanted to show the diversity of San Diego County using um, actual people. And it was just a kind of a fun story we did, which was... Um, a good discussion to have kind of as Trump's rhetoric was getting really intense in 2018. But as you can see, it's a combination of the line graph and all of the, the countries to see where people came from in San Diego. And that's all that I have. Thanks for coming. Um, we're excited. A Geographic Thought by Tim Cresswell, a 
fantastic read. And also you can read more stuff on data wrapper, Esri, and special thanks to Dr. David Wishart, who I basically learned all this stuff from. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to stop sharing your screen, or you did. Um, I wanted to to pinpoint a question. Anyone can ask a question, but um, so what are some like we we talked about this in the previous data training, like questions to ask yourself about whether this should be a map or whether this needs more discussion with Daniel <laughs> before asking for a map. Like, what are some thoughts about? I mean, I I like the idea of like, and I you taught me this, so. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really say anything to say, I want to show, use a map to show the shape of the states, because I think it looks cool, and then put 76%, 40%, 80% in each state to show people who like honey. That's not really a thing. <laughs> so what are some ways of thinking, if you're an editor, maybe, or a reporter trying to think about the best way to show what you're trying to say with data, if it is this a map? So is there like a spatial trend? Um, is there something interesting? Like you wouldn't expect like, like the cicadas, for example, like that's just a natural phenomena that needs to be mapped because we drew lines over the cicadas. They were there before. Um, but if it was just, you know, Missouri is expecting to have 70 billion cicadas and Illinois is going to have 80 billion cicadas, that's more of a bar chart. What amazing. are the questions do you have? I mean, people. I want to show you um, something. Here it is. Here is a, a close look at the um, thing we did with the California newsroom. This is a pretty good example of why of a good use for ma a map. You're trying to show where a thing is happening and how intense it's happening. And it's very simple to see that if you even don't even look at the increase in smoke days, you can look and see something's happening in the West versus something in the East, right? So you immediately can see that. And Daniel made it really easy to show how, okay, the most smoke days are there. And you can actually like isolate that there too. Um, and so this is another way of showing that, which I thought was pretty effective. And then again, here's Kansas. And then you can also just on the face of it, compare, oh, Nebraska seems to have it far worse than Kansas. And then let's go down here. Iowa's looking pretty good. In fact, they've got like no smoke day in most of the state. That's really awesome. So um, so it, it was a really good exercise. One of the first things that we did in the Midwest newsroom, I think. Um, and it was a really good way to to show um to show that. And so that's an example. And then I also wanted to show um this is the story that Daniel was talking about with Cassidy. And um so basically the story is about, well, Cassidy, you tell us what the story is about and what problem you're trying to solve with this data. Uh, yeah, so the story was just about kind of a loophole within Iowa real estate law that um, that basically allowed for um, some targeting maybe of um, vulnerable people and vulnerable populations. And so I worked with Daniel to figure out how to best show um, how these people were vulnerable. Um, and that's how we kind of decided um, timing wise. So this map also was able to um, talk about the timing of um, this town that was specifically hit by a pretty bad tornado. And um, if you look at it, a lot of the houses that were targeted um, were like in, within this path of the tornado. So that's why we had two different maps, one to show the actual tornado, and then one to show where these houses were located. And they were kind of like all I mean, with a few outliers, but like a few of all of them were kind of like right along that tornado path. And the thing I like about this contrast in maps is it also shows something that's kind of that's kind of unexpected that I don't think that if we hadn't looked at this data, when I say we, I mean Cassidy and Daniel, we wouldn't have known necessarily that there was this pattern. And so this is another beauty of like 
figuring out what you need to see and try to figure and, and what you need to show. And, you know, you may end up using, I mean, I think that um, this was a really very narrow space. We didn't show the whole state, right? But it was enough to show, wow, okay, yes, yeah, this lady really did her homework by figuring out that people whose houses were damaged or people who were somehow affected by the storm were vulnerable and might want to sell their homes um, or not, not want to sell their home, be vulnerable to her coming in and taking them illegally <laughs> or not legal, actually not illegally. We found out that it was not illegal. So I think that's also a really good example of um, uh, how to, to use maps. I really thought that was a great, I would not have thought of it that way. I maybe would have thought of showing like where the houses were, but to show this sort of little bit of a correlation is really, um, was really effective, I thought. Yeah, all of these are spatial trends and that's why it's mapped because it's actually communicating something that space is required to communicate. If it's just data, that's when it needs to be a different kind of visualization. And I know I've showed this to you all before, some of you, not all of you, but I just really like the Vinebrook, <laughs> the Vinebrook uh, project because, um, let me go ahead and share my screen. This was um, a lot of complicated data that um, we're going to rep reprise or reprise some of this um, for our follow-up story that we're doing um, soon. But um, so, I mean, this is pretty complicated. We had to show the three cities because we're looking at three cities and the median household income as well as the racial correlation because what we're trying to show is that this company buys properties in areas where income is low to middle middle and it's mostly majority non-white so how do you show that so you see percent white and and so you can and then you can actually like use control plus to scroll or you can just zoom to which i loved which is fancy. There we go. Whoa. Cool. So again, this takes time. This is not a 24 hour turn. <laughs> so, you know, this is a great reason why we love to have editors on here because you may not be able to, to articulate exactly what it is that in the language that Daniel speaks, but luckily Daniel speaks many languages in this world of journalism. And so if you say, you know, I want to show this with this, with this, he can tell you if it's possible or even if it's a good idea and how to do it and what he needs and maybe you can work on a project. And then the other thing I like about this story is that we have some more simple um, data wrapper stuff here. This is simply, there's no need to do a, a, a map for this, right? This is just showing the rents and the rent is too damn high as I like to say, right? And then here we have a different item and this is going to show the majority of homes managed by Vinebrook in these three cities are in census tracts that are predominantly non-white and have that medium household income. So we've seen where they are on a map, and now we can see where they are here in Kansas City, Omaha, and Kansas, and uh, St. Louis. And so it's just a really good example of um, there's three different things that we're, oh, there's four actually. And again, we don't need a map for this. Vinebrook Holdings Grow, this is a trend, right? So it's a trend to show how this company has just steadily been buying and buying and buying in each city. And that's uh, a, a trend thing. So we don't need a map for that. And there's no way we would want to combine all of those things in a map. Like if we, <laughs> that's just, that's that map that you showed us, right? Daniel's map would come up on if you searched examples of really bad maps. Um, so that is my favorite, one of my favorite examples of one of the projects we've done. Um, are there, does anybody have a project that they think might have a map, use for a map or wonder? What about, I'm gonna put Brian Heffernan on the spot. Brian, what about your Ferguson project? What what do you think your digital build out is gonna look like? And do you think that there would be something to be shown uh, spatially in in the 10 year 
maybe there isn't, but I'm wondering if you've thought about that or if anyone on Chad's part of that project too. Like, what could you show that would be interesting in that context? I don't know if he's actually with us. <laughs> See, this is how you get caught when you step away on you on Zoom. Huh. Hi, Chad. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Oh, it's been a good time. Well, I don't know. Friends are, yeah. So it's, we're still definitely like pretty uh, uh, early in the process. We're not entirely sure yet of what a map could look like. Um, yeah. So, I, I well, it's something to think thing, about. Uh, yeah, it is something to think about. And one thing I know for like the project, we're looking at different like topics and ideas, like, you know how did the protest movement change and stuff like that i mean there could be there potentially could be a map that shows like some of the different protests within the area i guess over the past uh like during the during 2014 15 probably mm -hmm. specifically um yeah. that we could like pull some data from um kind of think of some other things uh where there's probably going to be topics on sentencing and justice and uh you know certain areas where uh there are some payouts maybe from uh you know uh, different lawsuits or so about uh, uh kind of how you know certain jails or so were keeping people um for you know crack violations stuff like that i mean there could be some maps in there it's, it's pretty early so i'm just kind of thinking yeah. off the cuff on that but i definitely think there are I, I like the idea of revisiting like where these protests happen and maybe like how many people were involved or like was there police was there was there violence or people arrested that could be kind of interesting that could be um something to think about um i also remember that there were some other after michael brown was shot was it maybe a year later that the general there was a man shot in shaw yeah. um, on the, and and then there's been other ones right so there could be like so this happened here, this happened here, this happened here, which would be useful for people who are not from the area, because you're probably going to have a lot of eyeballs on. Um, and some of these folks, their stories have not really been told. And the interesting thing about the Shaw piece that's spatial to me is that it's sort of um, on the border of, well, it's changed a lot in, ten, in it's nine years now, but it was sort of not quite gentrified yet. Mm -hmm. It was in the process of that. And that could be like looking at like how the population has changed um, in some of the parts of our area um, since Ferguson could be interesting too, because there's been some, some shifts. So think about it, Chad. Yeah, that was the bond. Chad meet Daniel, Daniel about. meet Chad. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, Daniel. This is a great yeah. presentation, by the way. Yeah. So um, any other questions? Well, I had a, a very, um, this idea is just an infant. It's, it's a newborn, basically. Um, one, I want to do a story on the only Spanish-speaking Red Cross worker, and she covers, she's in charge of Nebraska and Iowa. Um, and so she says one of the, like, obviously she's like, my worst fear is like, I'm, I'm responding to one big emergency in Omaha, but at the same time, there's another Spanish-speaking family affected by an emergency in uh, Davenport, you know, and, and so she's like, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I was thinking like a potential map. And she says one of the number one things that she responds to are house fires, like specifically with Spanish speaking communities. So like a map that I was thinking covering both Nebraska and Iowa of like, where are the majority of house fires happening? But then I have kind of two factors of, and then also like, where are the majority Spanish speaking communities or Latino communities um, and kind of see where those potentially would either overlap or just seeing basically showing everybody the visual of like look at all of these places that this woman potentially has to cover all at the same time <laughs> I, I think it would be interesting to show a hypothetical like situation almost like if if there was a house fire in Davenport and one in Omaha you know how many hours is that <laughs> how far is that you know what what would be kind of a her like uh sort of number of miles that would have to be covered for her to deal with the family in Omaha and then you know within x number of 12 hours she's got to get to Davenport or something along those lines could be really interesting but i do think that a map that shows um where 
Hispanic populations are living in, in all, a whole region would be really interesting for a lot of stories. It could be a project that we we could work on that could be useful for, for people in many, in many types of stories, because I think that, you know, there's a, the assumption of uh, people living in the larger cities is not altogether accurate. And yeah, also, and, 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 and even, yeah. And even, even like Eastern Iowa has now got a lot of other refugee communities and, you know, so that could be, um, I mean, so, some kinds of data are, you know, sort of useful, not necessarily only for, using in a story, but being able to look at the data in a way that makes sense to you as a non-data person and go back to it and go back to it as a referral source, because we think of it as a source. You know, that's kind of why we were doing these data digests, which uh, were which we're suspending for now, but um, just as a source, you don't have to um, use it in a story, although that would be great because we created the visualization, but does it spark an idea or inform your work as a reporter in some way that's helpful. So um, so yeah, I think that could be a project we should talk about, Cassidy. Yeah, I think um, it would actually be super helpful. I can't tell yeah. you how many times within my stories I'm talking about like the Hispanic Latino population grew by 240% from 2010, like just showing people like how quickly like this community is mm -hmm. growing. And so I think it would be awesome to like have just the go-to resource of like, here's what, it, what they were and where they were in 2010. And then mm -hmm. just like, boom, and here they are in 2020 within the Midwest, yeah. know, something like that. And think about what a good tool that would be if you had a new reporter coming in and they were supposed to be covering certain um, communities and they could refer to that as a source, not necessarily for a single story, but for the, just to help their beat. So think you think about data in that way. Oh, so Daniel has shared. A yeah, Census Reporter is a website where you could search like percent of um, Hispanic people in Douglas County, Nebraska, and we'll get you some stats like that. Uh, it's just a faster way of querying it using human language versus knowing the tables and the variables and the various sensei and all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's a basically you should bookmark that. And um, uh, are there any more questions? Otherwise, we will. Um... We'll let you go, and, but I wanted to just remind you that Daniel does office hours uh, twice a month. His last one was yesterday. We post that in the Midwest Newsroom Slack as well as all, well, all the Slacks, whoever has Slack. And um, it's your chance to just ask questions. If it's not even a story that you're working on, but you just want to say, I didn't understand that thing you said on that training, or I don't know where to start or whatever it is. And of course, you can also reach him outside that time, but that's just a set aside time that um, you know you'll have his full attention. So be looking out for um, those dates. And I will challenge Chris Husted, who's helping with the Ferguson Project, <laughs> to remind in St. Louis Public Radio to be thinking, at least thinking about uh, not just maps, but what could we do to help them data-wise um, to make their stories really pop um, for this Ferguson Project. And I will be staring out um, the deck as well as the recording. Any final thoughts, Daniel? Space matters more than you think. Um, it, it's important to realize how we conceptualize space is so unique. And it's really noticeable how we derive meaning from places. Like, uh, I really enjoyed that seminar I took last semester because it's such a fundamental human thing to think about spaces and communicating that in our journalism, I think is something that we need to do more often. Yeah. I'll leave you and with this quote. Um, it's, it's a uh, geography rather than history st space rather than time that hides consequences from us by Edward Soja. How do you spell that last name? S O J A. Okay. That should be your tattoo. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Have a good afternoon.